in A.D. 66 to A.D. 70, Jewish zealots were gaining influence in the area and some intense fighting between them and the Roman forces began to ensue. And as an effort to end Roman occupation in Judea, in Jerusalem, uh, and also in Galilee and other areas of uh, heavy Jewish population, the zealots are able to inspire Jews to fight with them. This, this battle goes on for uh, about three and a half, almost four years, so between A.D. 66 and A.D. 70. The war resulted in Jerusalem being lied waste, wasted and the temple in Jerusalem being destroyed, which fulfilled Jesus' Olivet prophecy about what would happen to the temple in Jerusalem. There is evidence till this day uh, as to what happened there in A.D. 70. In Rome, there still exists what is known as the Arch of Titus, which, which, which features a, uh, a picture, if you will, of the uh, Jewish menorah as it is being carried away from Jerusalem. The only thing remaining there till this day now in Jerusalem is the Western Wall. And so in AD 66 to AD 70, the Zealots fight with the Romans and their, this first revolt was soundly put down by Titus and tens of thousands of Jews. Now I want you to hear this part because this part also touches on some of the claims that the black Hebrew Israelites uh, make today. And so many of them will quote uh, Deuteronomy 26 and 68 uh, to refer to uh, them or black people being the fulfillment of Jewish people or Israel being carried back to Egypt as slaves. What is interesting is not only does Titus send Jewish men back to Egypt in slave ships to work in Egyptian mines as slaves, but later, 26 years later, after the second revolt, Hadrian does the very same thing. And so this fulfills Deuteronomy 26 and 68. Many of those Jewish men died of starvation along the way. Many of them died of disease. Uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of them were either killed by sword or died in slavery in Egypt. This fulfilled what God told uh, the Israelites that if they would be disobedient to his word, that very same place that he delivered them from, they would return to, and, 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 and he even says that they would try to sell themselves, but their value would be zero. It's quite interesting that not only does uh, Josephus, not only does Josephus talk about it, uh, but many other scholars want to quote a couple of things here. Not only does Josephus talk about this event, but also the Roman historian Cassius, uh, the Roman historian Munter uh, also refers to it. And he says that the value of the Jewish person going back into Egypt as a slave was less than the value of a horse. So the black Hebrew Israelites then have no real claim when they attempt to say that uh, black people in America are really the true Jews who fulfilled uh, the prophecy in Deuteronomy 26 uh, and uh, 28 and 68 about going, being returned back into Egypt as slavery. And then Egypt then becomes symbolic for America. Those are two entirely separate historical events. One was fulfilled in the first century and fulfilled again at the very beginning of the second century and what happened to uh, black people from the area of, of Ghana uh, during what is called the transatlantic slave trade has absolutely nothing at all to do with Hebrew Israelites. So it's very important that we, we understand that. And so I want you to listen closely to this. The second revolt uh, happens uh, roughly between the, the era of 132 and 135. You might be familiar with this second Jewish revolt. It is also known as the Bar Kokhba War. Bar Kokhba War. 
I want to give you a couple of facts uh, about Bar Kokhba. And so, so his, his, his real name was Simon Bar Kosheba. And um, Rabbi Akiva, who was a well-known uh, and reputable rabbi of that day, saw uh, Bar Kosheba as the fulfillment of the prophecy given in the book of Numbers about the star, which was a messianic illusion. So he calls him Simon Bar Kokhba, which means son of the star, uh, which was another way of saying that he was uh, the Messiah. When he loses and when uh, the Jews are permanently forced from Jerusalem, Jerusalem is permanently is destroyed, and he is killed. Rabbi Akiva is also killed. The remaining Jews then later renamed him Simon Bar Kozeba, which means son of a liar, because, of course, he did not do what they expected him to do, and that is to uh, restore to Israel power and, 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 and to crush Rome, uh, the Roman occupation in that area. So the reason that these are important, and this is not just a history lesson, the reason this is important, beloved, is because this is the beginning of a major break that changes the demographic landscape of Christianity. The Pharisaic Jews began to resent the Jewish Christians because the Jewish Christians would not fight alongside of their countrymen. And why wouldn't they? Because to fight under the leadership of Simon Bar Kosheba or Bar Kokhba was to them disloyalty to Jesus. Because they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, they believed that fighting alongside of their fellow Jewish countrymen was actually to deny the messiahship of Jesus because Simon was being called the Messiah. This led to a lot of deep resentment uh, between the, 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 Jew, the various Jewish groups, particularly the Messianic group and those that were of uh, the Pharisaic party. This began to, this rift began to widen and ultimately led to what later we find in the second century, Justin Martyr and many of the early fathers, we find a lot of this sentiment that becomes anti-Semitic and a lot of polemics that were written against the Jews, which further widened that gap to the point that Jewish people simply began to resent Christianity and Christianity becomes predominantly Gentile by this time. So this is very important to understand because the de-Judaizing of Christianity, not only does it have its seeds in, in these historical events, but by the time Gentile leaders are predominantly the leaders of the church, which have been predominantly led by Jewish leaders, namely the apostles. By the time the Gentile leaders are firmly in place. Uh, the, the, these are, many of them, uh, the early church fathers. Many of their teaching uh, is what we call replacement theology. Many of them begin to allegorize the text and see themselves as Israel. They begin to teach that everything that happened to the Jews were a result of their disobedience and their judgment. And all that did was just widen the gap between Jewish believers and Gentile believers until the numbers of Jewish converts begin to drop to the degree that we see it today. It is predominantly, the church is predominantly Gentile. So the de-Judaizing of Christianity doesn't stop there. There were many edicts made and, 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 and many uh, policies. I don't have time to, to get into all of those, but many of the policies ensured that many of the things that had Jewish identity and Jewish cultural features were removed, done away with, ended. Christians were forbidden to worshiping on the Sabbath for for. for 
uh, for much of Christianity from AD 33 all the way to the very end of the first century, the beginning of the second century, Christians not only worshiped on the first day of the week, but they also met in synagogues on the Sabbath alongside of their Jewish brothers. That was ended by policy. They were forbidden to be circumcised. Any influence that was Jewish was highly forbidden. And so I want you to understand what I'm saying. There is some legitimacy to contextualization. And what I mean by that is, is that Christianity, uh, Christianity can be contextualized or it can be uh, understood in light of the context, the cultural context and geographical context of the people who become Christian. So long as that contextualization does not undermine the meaning and the message of scripture. And so it is legitimate to contextualize. Here in America, Christianity is completely contextualized. I, I know you don't believe that Western Christianity is what original Eastern Christianity actually looked like. I mean, they didn't have a prosperity gospel. <laughs> you know, they weren't running around prophesying Cadillacs and, and houses and all these other things that you see some of these televangelists doing. See, these kind of things are contextualized to uh, this consumeristic and this capitalistic uh, society that we live in, and we have almost made Christianity a reflection of that. Not almost, we have. We've even contextualized Christianity to our political affiliation. <laughs> so, so, see, see these, these are contextualizations. And, 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 and so Christianity was contextualized wherever it went. But, the, but there's a difference between contextualization and stripping Christianity of its Jewish influence and root. See, see, see the reality is, is if that if Judaism is at the root of the tree that we have been engrafted into, you cannot separate the branch from the tree without killing it. And so we have a Jewish root to our faith. And when that root is removed, what ended up happening to it is, is that the influence of Christianity uh, began to be predominantly characterized and defined as Romish and, and even Greek and Latinish. In other words, European. One of the earliest frescoes, which was found uh, at a monastery in Mount Sinai, roughly around the fourth century, is the image, a painting, of a white Jesus. We're not talking about this nonsense that the Hebrew Israelites, uh, uh, you know, want to claim uh, there about, uh, what's the, what's the, what's the, his name has just slipped my mind there. Um, what's his name? They say that the, the modern day paintings of Jesus, uh, uh, Caesar Bajor, uh, uh, Bagoria. There you go. What, what, what is it? Caesar Bajor. There you go. And, 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 and so, but that's false historically. First of all, there's no historical evidence uh, that any such rendition or painting uh, was done um, in the likeness of Caesar Bajor. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, You've got predating Caesar Bajor, you've got earlier renditions of Jesus looking European hundreds of years earlier than that. And, and, and so there are those who say, oh, well, you know, every culture has got, they got oriental looking Jesuses and this, that, and the other. But that's not what we have here. There was a deliberate, a very, very deliberate uh, attempt to de-Judaize Christianity and make it a European uh, subset. There was a very deliberate attempt to do that. And so it was very important for them to characterize Jesus uh, and to paint him in a way that represented uh, European Christianity or Roman Christianity. 